you know, I think a lot of times when people say to you, you shouldn't, what they're really saying is I couldn't and therefore don't. Welcome to the Side Hustle Lounge. If you're looking for flexible ways to earn income, grow your mindset and live the lifestyle you've always dreamed of, you're in the right place. So lower the lights, grab your favorite beverage and join your host, founder of notarycoach.com and Amazon best-selling author of Sign and Thrive, How to Make Six Figures as a Mobile Notary and Loan Signing Agent, Bill Soroka. Cheers, and welcome to my guest today, Tara Green. She's the Chief Visionary Officer and host of the Should Theory podcast. She's also an author, speaker, a consultant that moves people from I should to I am. Tara, welcome, and thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that we got to reconnect again. I have missed you as well. So yeah. Glad to get together and talk about something that we're both passionate we were talking about how um, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, business people, humans in general can stop shooting all over themselves. Yes. And you, before I ask my first question, I wonder if you could explain what shooting all over yourself really is for people. I will. So generally, I think we think of should with a negative connotation. It isn't always, right? There are motivational shoulds like I should get off the couch and go to the gym. But for the most part, I think when we think about the word should, it's ridden with guilt or remorse. I should have spent more time with them. I should have told them how I felt. I should just stay put because it's safe, because it's reliable, because it's what everybody expects me to do. And I think that we tend to do it to ourselves. I should work more. I should make more money. I mean, I, the list could go on. And I think everybody's shoulds are individual to them and their situation, although there are, like the ones I just mentioned, ones that we all can relate to and find our own, oh, yeah, I do that moment in them. Yeah, you let off with one of the biggest ones for me is uh, I should go to the gym. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. D just having the membership doesn't make things happen. You actually have to physically go there, apparently. Continue to learn that lesson every day. Um, <laughs> I, I love this because I think um, shoulds with that regret or that remorse or that shame almost attached to them mm -hmm. is so disempowering that it, it doesn't make us step forward and change our behavior or our thoughts. No, if anything, it, it does the opposite and forces us to shrink into the corner. Yeah, shrink into the corner. I love that. Mm -hmm. Why Why is, I mean, you've, you've got an incredible career, 22 years in education. Now we're making a, a shift mm -hmm. into um, the consulting and the authorship, and the speaking and the mastermind you've got going on and the podcast you've got. Why, why is this your thing? Why is um, people stop shooting I, themselves? It's so important. I think it's a couple of things. Number one, um, it's my thing because it's what I have done to myself low these 47 years. Um, you know, I have always been a people pleaser. I have always been a person who worried what everybody else thinks, including the garbage man. Does he think my garbage can is too dirty? Should I clean it? I'm not sure. I don't want him to be upset. Mm. So that's just who I have always been. Um, my parents were both in education and had very high expectations for me, but also had what I would call more traditional expectations about what makes a career um, what a responsible person does. And so it was never, will you go to college? It was, where will you go to college? And the path was you get married, or I'm sorry, you graduate high school, you go to college, you get your master's, you get married, you have children, you work for 30 years, and then you go right off into the sunset and enjoy your life. And why do I have to wait till that end part to enjoy my life? Number one. But um, that was the expectation. I always joke and say, when I went to college, there was no such thing as ad drop. You know, it wasn't you are in a course and within two weeks you go, mm, this isn't the right one. My parents were like, if that's what you have to take, that's what you take. 
And so as a result, I got a D in Russian history. But anyway, (laughs) um, terrible class. But um, so I have been that people pleaser. And um, part of the way when I finished student teaching, I remember saying to my mom, I hate this. (laughs) It's not what I want to do. I started out as a theater and dance major. And um, it was not in the cards for me. It didn't help that at the age of 18, I looked like I was 12. I appreciate it now. But back then, uh, I looked like I was 12. I was five feet tall. I certainly wasn't going to be a rockette, you know. So I was going to be that girl on 90210 that was like 32 (laughs) and playing a high school uh, student. That would have been me. So um, anyhow, I just didn't have the guts to say, no, I'm forging my own path, again, being a people pleaser and an obedient. Um, and I spent a lot of years, I don't want to say blaming my parents, but feeling like, well, I'm here because this is the career my parents wanted me to have. Um, they were educators, and I think they viewed it as reliable um, and with good benefits and retirement package, which it, it is. <laughs> so. Um, you know, in hindsight now at, at the age I'm at, you know, I'm 47 at this point and, and looking back, I realize that blaming them doesn't make me- much sense because really I didn't have the wherewithal to say, no, I'm forging my own path. No, I'm, I don't want to major in what you're majoring, wanting me to major in. And if that means you don't pay for college, I'll figure it out myself. I didn't do that. I just said, okay, and went along. So really, I'm equally to blame if we're going to use that word. Um, But it was just what was in the stars for me at that time. So I went into education, um, you know, after I graduated, my dad passed away right after I graduated from cancer. And so I went to school full time to get my master's. And I finally landed a position and I taught for um, seven years uh, teaching elementary school and changing my grade level almost every year for my own interest to keep it fresh. And I got to a point where I said to my then husband, uh, I can't, this 30 years, there's got to be something else. So I'm going to try administration. And I went back to school while teaching, got my administrative certification. And by 2005, I was a high school assistant principal. And I've been a school administrator ever since. So with that said, I have found my niche in ed- education. Is it niche? Is it niche? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Either. I like niche sometimes. Unless okay. something rhymes with niche, then I use um, niche. It sounds fancy. Um, <laughs> but I, I found my niche uh, in that um, I lead with the heart. I am vulnerable when I lead. I put people before paper and um, I have made it a point. I've been a a building principal since 2009 and um, I know every single student by name. I know what their interests are. I know what their struggles are. And that has been my forte for my entire career. Um, You know, and so in doing that, it has, I have found a way to put things I love into it and get things I love out of it. However, I would go through this annual or at least biannual, I got to get out. I, it's not, there's something missing. I'm called to do something else. I don't know what it is. Um, I know when you and I talked last time, you were, you know, you called yourself a multi potential. I, I use that word all the time now. I would constantly be having these creative ideas of side hustles that, hopefully would be something I could transfer into. Um, My favorite that gets a laugh was a continuing ed course, place where you could take courses and Froyo place. And I was going to call it Yo Self Institute. And it was going to be the next sensation and go viral and (laughs) franchise out. It was going to be great, but it never happened. (laughs) It never happened. Um, You know, so that was one. I had an online zero waste business um, where I sold things to help people live a more um, sustainable lifestyle. And I called it Zilch Zero Waste Goods. I had that online store on the side for a while. They were all okay. And they, they got my creative juices flowing. But they all would require me at some point to make them successful to stop what I was doing and move on. 
And in addition to all of the other things I explained about my parents, they also raised me, my mom especially, because my parents did get divorced when I was younger. Um, you need to be able to do everything for yourself. You need to be able to financially sustain yourself so that when you meet someone, it's not I need you, it's I choose you. Mm. And so that's how I've lived my life. I was the breadwinner with with um, my ex-husband. I'm financially, as far as comparing salaries on paper, I still am. Um, and the years in between where it was just me. And um, so the idea of taking a risk, especially when it was just me responsible for my two kids, was not something that I felt I could do or had permission to do. So, um, I am the queen of shooting all over yourself <laughs> simply from, you know, that story that I just told you. So yeah. this year, um, my youngest is about in a couple of weeks to go off to college and my oldest is about to start his junior year of college. And so she has worked really hard and got this amazing academic scholarship to her school of choice. To the point that when I looked at what the bottom line boiled down to for my portion of what I'm responsible for her to go to school, I looked at my savings that I had accumulated for her college and realized that I had enough to cover all four years right now today in that account. And I went, huh, okay. Um, and it doesn't mean I'm a really good saver. It just means she's a really good student, by the way. <laughs> But um, that was a freeing moment for me because I had enough to cover my son's last two years. I have enough to cover her four years. And that burden of responsibility was lifted to some degree. Um, and I have an amazing husband who said, listen, you do this every year. You go through your annual. I can't do this anymore every year. And you, I'd rather have a happy you and eat tuna fish every day than a miserable you and be able to do whatever we want. So it's time to should or get off the pot. Right. So then it's just a matter of saying, okay, do I want to build a bridge or do I want to take a leap of faith? Yeah. And currently I'm building a bridge. And so um, within that, there are little leaps of faith as you build that bridge, I think, um, as you put yourself out there. I know for me, a big step was um, back in February when I said, you know what, I'm going to start to do these things. I felt like I had a book in me. I felt like um, my forte is people and talking to people and interviewing. I do it for a living. And so um, so I said, well, you know, let me start this podcast and I'll write this book, which, you know, is in, in outline form for sure. And um, that started happening. And then I realized, you know, I kind of coach people, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, um, every day. I'm the senior administrator in my district. So people in my district come to me and say, Tara, how would you handle X, Y, Z? Um, I'm second from the top senior administrator in my county. So amongst our organization, when we bounce ideas off, off of each other, I have people coming to me saying, what do you think about this? How would you handle that? And, um, then throw in their parents that you deal with on the regular kids that you deal with on the regular teachers and having just gone through, not quite done yet, but <laughs> having just gone through COVID and what it's done to education, as far as how you have to shift and pivot and figure stuff out. It made me realize that I do this every day as part of my career. Why can't I do it? not in education, for people who are just like me, who at some point in their lives said, I keep feeling like there's a hole and I need to fill it. And I'm not quite sure how. So I lead by example and I coach by example um, and use my own experiences. You know, I always say you need somebody who is just a few steps on the path ahead of you, right. who can kind of take your hand and say, come on, this is the way I figured this part out. Let's go. Um, and, and can speak to you from the trenches as it were. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you said that. I think, I think people put too much pressure on themselves when making, um, big, 
choices like this. Like there's a lot of validity and the reality is real. You've got family to take care of. You have your responsibilities. And then I think we also build up um, some false perspectives on what we can do. And we think we have to start from scratch every time we make a shift. I love, I love how you um, take what you're doing every day. So you're not totally tapping your energy or stretching or pointing your energy in two different directions. Yeah. Just taking what you do and applying it to this. I say that all the time. Uh, in fact, I just wrote uh, an article about this saying how we do such a disservice to ourselves when we want to do something new or we know we need to make a change. Think about what most other people would say. I have to start all over. You know, I'm I'm 22 years in my career. I, I'm not ready to start over. I don't want to start over. And start over to me, I always think about a video game. You know, I always think about um, it, it begins, you have to begin with nothing is the connotation that comes with it. And so what I try to say is, no, you need to change direction. You're making an informed decision to change direction. And starting over implies that you're stripping yourself of all of your stuff. Whereas changing direction is you take with you your experience, your wisdom, your um, successes and your failures and what you've learned from them, your years on the planet, which brings a lot of, of depth. And you take all of that with you, making an informed decision to change direction. That doesn't mean you don't have to learn new things to get that done, but you're also not stripping yourself of all of your life experience and knowledge. Yeah, that's it's such a great point. There is everything that made you great before, because we've all been really good at something in mm -hmm. our past, or we really enjoyed something, or we had a skill set or personality, all of that comes right along with you. You don't know, right. get out the door and then start all over again. And I think having the, the idea of having to start over is something that it's a, a different way to shit on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I should stay put, I don't want to start all over again. I'm so I'm too far in to get out. I should stay. I should work until I get that magic number of retirement without penalty or the benefit package or whatever. When really, you know, what's to say that you wouldn't just maintain? Nobody's going to take that away from you. Maintain what you've already built and then just start building in another pile over here. And then when you're done, you have two piles and that's OK. <laughs> it's OK to have two piles. I have six piles. But it's good. <laughs> Absolutely. There is uh, something else that you said. I wondered if you could possibly elaborate on it because it's going to lead us to how um, how we can relieve ourselves and somebody should. But mm -hmm. you said that you find ways in your current job or over the last 22 years to find your joy and passion and kind of weave it into what you did every day. And it reminded me of a song. Um, uh, I don't know who sang it, but it's if you can't be with the one you love. Oh, yeah, yeah I love the one you're with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we can apply that to a job, too, because sometimes we are. We're just in it. We're, we don't have the perspective. Maybe we're just like right there in it. So we don't have the perspective to, to leave or we don't have the knowledge yet. We don't know what we don't know sometimes. So how do you uh, how did you weave those moments of joy into a, a job that you knew wasn't quite? I think, I think that, um, you know, it, I don't want to paint a picture that says getting rid of your shoulds and making a change requires a drastic life change. It could be something as simple as I want to be healthier and feel better, you know, and so I need to make a change in how I eat and how I exercise. You know, you and I talked about that, um, you know, the last time we talked and I think, um, so to the point that you're, you're asking about, if there are reasons that you need to stay put in your relationship, in your career, in your whatever it is, then I think your next best step is to say, where in here, whatever this is, can I make improvements to what I already have? You know, in, in the same way that you own a home and you choose to renovate or make improvements to your home, you chip away with, oh, you know, what's the most effective, beneficial thing in this house that I'm living in that needs improvements. Wow. If I upgrade the kitchen first, I'm going to get a lot of use out of it. It's going to, you know, be the thing that increases the value of the house the most, whatever your reasons are, there's going to be a reason why you say the kitchen is the room that is the most beneficial to go to first. Similarly, 
whether it's a huge shift that you make or something that needs to just be tweaked or slightly renovated, you do that same thing. You take a survey of what it is that you have, what it is that you feel like is missing, and is there a way to insert that into what I already have? You know, if my marriage is is struggling, are there things we can do? And I'm going to be very superficial. Can we go, go on more date nights? Can we take more time with each other? Will that fill some of the voids? You know, what is it? Similarly, um, for me in education, you know, I, I went back to how I wanted to um, performing was sort of my first love, theater and dance. We created a faculty talent show. And that was a production that we put on every other year. And uh, we built a TV station, a TV studio in our school and did televised morning announcements. And so there were little places like that um, where I could infuse joy. And then there were places that I found that I didn't even know I would enjoy, um, such as helping others in within my field and talking to them about um, you know, being a leader or, or just, I don't want to say how I do what I do, but, you know, people that have the same career or the same job that you do saying, this is the situation I have, what did you do? And then being able to offer that advice uh, really fills the bucket. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, almost imperative for joy and happiness is when you can reach back, extend a hand, shine a light, watch out for that rock. Here's the stairs. We got to hack a root over here for you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, what do we do about um, living up to expectate other people's expectations? Or I'd love for you to even go into how do you live up to our own expectations sometimes? Step one, don't give a flip. <laughs> <laughs> so proud of myself that I didn't say the other word right now. Um, you know, that for me was the biggest struggle was, you know, not caring if the gar garbage man thought that my garbage can was too dirty. And I think as we age and we become more comfortable in our own skin, some of that um, confidence just happens naturally. Whether we do anything or not, it's just living and experiencing life. You, you, you begin to, I don't want to say care less, but you begin to be less affected by other people's opinions and expectations. And I think... Um, it's a process of, and this part goes for yourself as well, realizing that the little moments and the little things are so much more important than the big things and the material things. And that's an exercise for self and for, um, you know, the world and, and who else might be looking at you. Um, more specifically, I think it's a, a confidence problem. I think that too often, well, I'll say it this way. If we are confident in who we are, what we're about, and what our strengths are, then we tend to be less affected by what others think we are and our strengths are. You know, if you are comfortable in your own skin, you know, you see it when you have someone rocking some outfit that they think looks amazing and they're walking down the street like they, you know, designed it, let alone are wearing it, you know. They don't care if it doesn't fit. They don't care if it's not the right outfit for that setting. They are rocking it. It doesn't know? match. They don't care. They love they it. Don't care. Yeah. And that's confidence, you know. And so um, one of the things I realized was looking at your accomplishments and knowing what they are and doing it in a way that they are compiled, for lack of a better word. I think helps a lot of people realize all that they are and all that they're capable of. So I always call it uncovering your inner badass. <laughs> and um, so that was one of the things that happened for me. Um, I was I was going into a Facebook group. And, you know, when you join some sort of a discussion group and it's, oh, tell us about yourself and introduce, give us a little bit of your background. And I did the same thing that I think everybody does is I read other people's introductory posts. So I get a sense for where's the bar, you know, yeah. what is it that people are expecting that I share? You know, uh, do I have to talk about, oh, my child's an honor student and I own these two cars? No. Or are people being real? Are they being very surface level? Are they going deep? because you don't want to post too much. 
You don't want to share, uh, overshare, and you also don't want to be too flippant and not tell enough, depending on the nature of the group. So all this pressure. And so I look through these other people posts and po- blah, 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 people's posts, and I realize that um, what they're sharing is sort of a, a triptych or a t- a itinerary of things they have done. And it's a pretty solid variety. It's not cocky and it's not um, annoying, but it's also not superficial. So I say, okay, and I dive in. I'm Tara Grieve, you know, I live in upstate New York. I've been in education for 22 years. And, you know, when I'm not in education, here's some of the things I have done. And I start listing some things, you know, um, I've run two half marathons for charity and I have, I don't know. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have flown a biplane. I, uh, I grew up working at a world war airplane museum and I was a damsel in distress and I'm listing all of those things. You know, one of my biggest milestones is um, my school was in a, a nationally televised hostage crisis in 2009. And I ended up, having to be the incident commander and and leading my school through a hostage crisis with an armed gunman that made national news. Now, to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, that happened. I should write down like, oh, that was a thing that I did that I'm proud of. Um, but it was like not even a whole sentence. And again, I'm like, and I was a single mom and I did this and I ran that. And I started listing the things Again, not trying to promote myself, but just to say it. And I looked at the list before I hit publish. And there was this moment of, holy crap, (laughs) you know? Uh, And yeah, and there were things on there like, you know, led a Girl Scout troop. You know, I don't know. It was it was everything. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was this really big moment where I looked at it. And not only did I look at it for what was on it, I looked at it for what was happening in my life when I accomplished some of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, what struggles, Uh, you know, parent dying of cancer, parent dying of cancer again, Um, you know, uh, going through a divorce, trying times that you may have, and yet you, you do these things. And I had this epiphany of, uh, I've done all these things. I can really do anything I set my mind to. And that really was a foundation for me of anybody can do what I just did. You know, anybody can make a list of their accomplishments um, because when else do you ever do that? You do them, you achieve the thing. You know, you, I ran a PTA fundraiser and then the PTA fundraiser is over and you probably don't think about it again. I, you know, I worked at an airplane museum. It, there's a lot of people around here that worked at that airplane museum. So I don't think much of it. But when I really do think about it, it's like, yeah, but that's local to here. And outside of here, it's like, I'm sorry, you did what? <laughs> that's pretty damn cool. Correct. So, um, you know, I think I, it made me realize that anybody could do this and really not only look at it as if it was a different person that was being described and really have an appreciation for what's on it, but use it to build their own confidence to realize, wow, look at, it's not like, I don't think I could do this change I want to do. It's look what I've already done to build that confidence to then do the thing, whether the thing is small changes to infuse happiness where you are or big changes because you're ready to make a whole shift like we were talking about before. Yeah, that's huge. I think, I mean, what a reminder, I think it was Glennon Doyle who says, we can do hard things or you can do hard things. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, I think that's great advice to remind yourself of what you are capable of. And we do, we tend to discount it. We don't celebrate. I'm, uh, this happens to me all the time. I struggle with remembering to celebrate anything. I have to remind myself to make, to celebrate things. But when you don't, when you don't have those little lists and reminders, it's really easy to let the, the negative stuff. And it's, yeah, I read an interesting uh, article or a book, probably a book, knowing me, um, about the science of why negative things uh, mean more to our brains mm-hmm. because it's part of our uh, our brains trying to protect us. 
So it makes negative, it gives more weight to the negative things in your life. And if you don't stop, hit pause and remind yourself of your inner badass, as you said, mm -hmm. it can, it can look like maybe you can't do hard things or then you start yeah. losing your confidence. Well, okay. transfer it back to education, you know, on the daily during the school year, I'm talking to teenagers who could have this amazing run of accomplishments and it takes one negative comment yeah. from another person to wreck their entire um, psyche and their entire confidence. And I say to them all the time, 10 people could compliment you on what you're wearing today. And you could walk around and be like, yeah, this is a great outfit. I feel great. And one person has to make a negative comment and you will not think about the other 10 people's comments at all. One it, comment and you're done. It is so weird how that works. You know, um, if, if, when you're branching into things like YouTube and Facebook and you start posting stuff, and podcasts and books, mm -hmm. you can have a thousand great reviews and one one star yep. review. And guess which one you obsess about? Yep. And I can speak from personal experience. Yeah, yep. exactly. It's true. It's, you know, it's everything. It's not how old you are. It's not what the thing is. Um, but yeah, one negative uh, comment or thought can out wipe out 10, 20 positive years of positivity and you have one bad review and you're done, yeah. you know, or you're questioning your life choices because <laughs> one person said, I'm not, that's not for me. And I think that's the other thing is realizing that you aren't for everybody. Huge, right? Right. I mean, put it on a simple, a simple level. How many people drink tea? How many people drink coffee? You know, both are equally beneficial in the wheelhouse of caffeine. They both have their place. You know, it's not for everybody. Coffee's not for everybody. Tea's not for everybody. Yeah. And it's not for everybody. If coffee took it personally, we'd never see it again. We never would see it again. And and I think that's the other realization is you aren't going to be for everybody just like everybody isn't for you. You don't like everybody you meet. But that would be exhausting if we did, right? <laughs> the um, how, how do you actually boost self-confidence to a, a higher level? Did you put into, I mean, in addition to doing the uncovering your badass exercise you described, uh, is there anything else that you did to help overcome? I mean, you had really strong family expectations but yeah. of the regular societal expectations too. What else did you do to overcome those? Um, you know, I think it's it's a better question would be, what am I doing? Ah. You know, and, I, and I think that's the other piece of this is I don't think you ever stop shooting on yourself. Um. You can be well-versed in, in self-development because, man, is that a vortex that sucks you down the hole and you read all the books and, and do all the things. Um, you could be well-versed, deep content knowledge about, about your psyche and your confidence and all the things, and you're still going to find ways to have doubt, self-doubt, nerves, um, question a direction. I don't think that ever goes away. And so, um, to some degree, it keeps us sharp to some degree, it keeps us motivated, but again, it can hinder us as well. And so, um, you know, I made that list. I, I guess the biggest other thing I could say is I'm in the process now of giving myself permission to make those next steps, giving myself permission to be true to what it is that I want to do. And I think the other piece that's important is having the and in your life and not the or. Mm -hmm. Meaning, um, I said earlier about building a bridge. You know, you can stay in your place that gives you fiscal security for now and, you know, start learning whatever you might need to learn to do what you want to do. I mean, in the last six months, I've had to learn how to create music, use an editing tool, um, produce a podcast, what microphone to buy, what platform to record on, blah, blah, blah. You know, just that learning curve has been, you know, a lot. Yeah, that, and that's huge. And then you prove your, to yourself that you can actually do those things. Right. So it's saying and. You know, it's not I'm going to be an educator or I'm going to be mm -hmm. someone that helps people 
move past X, Y, Z. I can be both, you know, in the same way that you might say, I I can't be a mom and have a career. Uh, Yeah, you can. I can be both. And so the other piece besides and um, is infusing in yourself just that ability to shift and pivot and say, I thought this was the right direction, but nope, I'm just going to shift over here. I'm going to change direction again, meaning I've done this for 22 years. Let's say my podcast falls apart tomorrow and nobody listens to it and I decide to shut it down. That doesn't mean I can't start something new after that. Yeah. And I think that's the other the other thing that we have to learn. And I say this to uh, educational leaders all the time. Um, I think really educational and corporate leaders feel stuck often because Once you are an administrator or a CEO or whatever you are, you are expected to have all of the answers all the time. You're expected to maintain your composure. You're expected to be able to come up with a solution. You're You're expected to be able to not show fear or frustration and have all the answers. Um, Here's a secret. We don't have all the answers. We get scared as hell. We don't always know what to do. And the pandemic, I think, really showed that to a lot of people. So that's the other thing that I talked to is, about is, you know, being willing to be vulnerable and say, you know, I don't know. And I would even go so far as to say that some of my strongest moments as a school leader in the last year and a half have been some of my weakest, you know, mm-hmm. where I'm talking to my faculty going, guys, this is hard. I'm crying at night. I'm stressed out. I don't know what to do. I'm worried about my own kids who are seniors in high school. Um, This is a lot. And it's a lot for you. And it's a lot for me versus don't worry, suck it up. This is what we're going to do. Here's the plan. Right. I bet that was very much appreciated too. I find that people appreciate someone who is real (laughs) and approachable. You know, um, I'm, just shows the power of vulnerability. I think, I think that it feels like people are craving vulnerability and authenticity. I think it Mm -hmm. ties right into that. Mm -hmm. We don't, although we do love to have a guide, we'd love to have a leader that knows the way we also would appreciate knowing that they're a human being and they're experiencing or have experienced the same fears, frustration. And it, It goes back to what I do when I help other people, be it students be it in my educational career or be it in dealing with, you know, masterminds or or one-on-one. My purpose, my process isn't to say, um, I'm going to tell you why you're a badass. I'm going to tell you what direction you should take because who am I, you know, other than someone who has experienced many of the same feelings, who, you know, is doing the same type of thing. I view myself more as someone who gives you the pathway. You know, think about what I just said. I help other people uncover that they are a badass. I don't tell them why they're a badass. They figure it out for themselves. And and I think that's the key is, you know, who am I to tell you what choice you should make or what your shift should be? Um, Because then I'm just shitting on you (laughs) instead of shitting on myself. And so my job is better to help you build your own confidence, help you figure out what direction makes the most sense to you. You know, I talked about the kitchen earlier. It's no different than with your own thing. What thing that interests you that you feel called to would be the most beneficial to you in your life if you did it right now? Of all these things, which one is it? Okay, great. That's the one. What do we need to do to get you there? You know, so I see myself more as someone that again, takes you by the hand and says, now you're going to go here and you're going to answer these, these questions that are looming in your head. Oh, watch out for this pitfall. Okay. You're done with that. Great. The next step is over there. So I'm more of the guide. The guide. Yeah. And I am the, you know, Buddha that has all the answers. (laughs) And and that's way more real. Uh, And I think too, uh, a lot of people put the pressure on us. Like you use the kitchen analogy. But sometimes if your budget or your bandwidth can't be the kitchen, it can be changing the curtains or hanging a picture. Just something that uh, is a step forward in the right direction. So to that point, who knows? Yeah, exactly. So, but I think with a lot of people or and with a lot of people, there is uh, some shame that comes with the shoulds. I should be able to do this. Oh, I shouldn't be even in this situation. So 
it sounds like some self-love and forgiveness plays into this. What do you think of that? Absolutely. Um, you know, think about what I said earlier, giving yourself permission, I think is one of the greatest acts of self-love. Giving yourself permission to say this thing that I've, d- I've chosen doesn't fit me anymore. Um, you know, giving yourself permission to say whatever this that I have is, it's not that it's not good enough. It's not that I'm not satisfied with it. It has served me well, but I've outgrown it. And so it's time for me to appreciate what it was and now build what's next. And, and, you know, I think that's something that we just don't do for ourselves. And, you know, you said living up to other people's expectations or worrying what other people think. It's interesting. The people who I can think of two examples of this, but the people who I talk to, and I've been slowly easing into this process. Um, you know, I think I said it earlier, it was a huge step for me to switch my about on my Facebook to just say principal to principal, podcast host, author, keynote speaker. And then I hit the button and then was like, oh my God, what are people going to say? They're going to wonder what I'm doing. They're going to think I'm going through a midlife crisis. And all I got as a response was awesome. Cool. That's great. Can't wait to see what it's all about. You know, so it's, it's having that courage to put stuff out there. And then you're, you're so worried about what people are going to think. And then you end up being shocked to find that 90% of the people are going to be like, good for you. And the 10% that aren't, um, often it's not judgment, it's jealousy. And here's what I mean by that. Um, When I was getting divorced, lo, these many years ago, um, you know, people had their opinions and the people that I found when I look back now, who were the most judgmental about uh, the choices that we were making as a family um, were unhappily married women. They were the most vocal to me or behind my back about the choices that I was making. and. Now, you know, 15, 16, 17, whatever it's been years later, um, it's interesting to me how many of them are divorced. (laughs) Um, You know, so similarly, I would say when I talk now ever about, you know, I might not be the principal of this building anymore. I might switch to another job in education. I might just become a consultant. I'm not sure, but I feel like maybe I've you know, outgrown my time here and it's time to move on to something else. And there are people who are like, that's awesome. But then there's people that are like, I don't want a new principal. You know, I, I don't, I don't want you to leave. You shouldn't leave. You, you won't be happy because I don't want a new principal. Well, is that about me or is that about you? (laughs) And so, you know, I think a lot of times when people say to you, you shouldn't, what they're really saying is I couldn't. Mm. And therefore don't (laughs) because I'll feel bad if you do it. I'll feel worse about myself if you successfully do it. Yeah. You know, there's some people, those people that they can't build themselves up. So they pull you down so that you're at that same level. Um, But yeah, you know, is it jealousy or is it judgment? And I think that's a huge question that we need to ask ourselves when we get all hung up in what are other people going to say if. Yeah. I think, wow, you've, said a lot of things that I'd like to just revisit there. First, since you just capped it off there, um, I think we'd probably be surprised that there's a lot less people thinking about us in the first place. Would you agree with that? Yes. uh, They've got their own lives going on, and I think we project um, a lot on that. The other thing is that you mentioned is that uh, how much love and support you got whenever you do make those changes, and I have found that too. Uh, that we're surrounded by people who love and support mm-hmm. us. If we give them a chance to, if we get right. vulnerable and we take a risk, when you update your uh, about profile or you share your podcast yep. or you mention you're starting a new business, I've started a lot of them, so I knew that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other huge point here, though, is um, this advice that you're giving is basically not, don't dim your light to make other people more comfortable. No. And don't dim your light because you're afraid that people will criticize your light's brightness. Again, because maybe they can't make their own light that bright. And so it's not, it's not judgment of your light. It's jealousy that they don't know how to make their light that bright. 
Yeah, I think that's exactly what it comes down to. Because I think they're going through their own shoulds, right? They're shitting all over we themselves. All are. We, we all are. Should, I should be doing that. I should be doing that. Oh, there they go doing that. That's pissing me off. Mm-hmm. The dragon. I, love the, I love the crab story uh, where the crabs are in the bucket. And this is, uh, have you heard this analogy yes, story? Yes, tell it because it's so good. So the, when crabs are in a bucket, they'll constantly climb, 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 trying to get out of the bucket. If one of them grabs the edge of the bucket and finally starts to pull themselves up, all the other crabs in the bucket grab that crab and pull it back down into the bucket. So they all just sit in a bucket and live mm-hmm. the same life. Or about to no longer live the same life. So in, in a lot of ways, uh, there are some human experiences that demonstrate that too. Absolutely. People, people get intimidated by your greatness and you can't let that stop you. Mm-hmm. We we don't straighten each other's crowns enough. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, Tara, this has been an amazing conversation. We're 45 minutes into it. I feel like I get, like last time, I feel like I could just talk to you the entire time. But there is, there's one question that I have and I wondered mm-hmm. if I'd love to hear your perspective on it is yep. how do we balance out having big hopes and dreams for ourselves mm-hmm. um, but also how, how do we balance that with unrealistic expectations um, I think the biggest and best answer that I could give you to that is um, first with a question what connotates unrealistic yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question. <laughs> so, or I should say, what makes it unrealistic? Now, um, if I were to say to you, I want to be the number one quarterback in the NFL, that is unrealistic. Why? I've seen your two sides, Tara. <laughs> I know. I'm 47. I'm five feet tall. <laughs> I might even be 4'11 at this point in my life. Um <laughs> Those are just two reasons <laughs> why I'm probably not, you know, I was speedy back in the day, but again, 47 years old. So um, unrealistic in that regard, I think we can all set some sort of a goal that we know for a fact um, is not realistic. And I think sometimes we appease our need for change by doing things like that, like applying for a job that you never you know you're not qualified for or you know they're never going to call you right i'm going to apply to this job at google where i don't even have i don't know anything, enough about it but i'm going to apply for this it a jo- job at google now i can say to myself i know i need a, a change in fact i'm applying for other jobs um yeah you're setting yourself up to scratch the itch but not in a way that's realistic because there's not going to be any accountability afterwards or follow-up required on your part, but you can still satisfy yourself and say, um, I, well, I applied for the job. So you so, think it's, a, you, we can set ourselves up as, as kind of a cop out. It's like, Oh, I'm applying yeah. for a job, but, and then you they get validation that life doesn't work out for them. Right. You, that. you satisfy, you know, gee, I, I really need to lose some weight. So for my health and my clothes don't fit right. And then you get an outfit that is a size up and you look better in it, but maybe you still don't feel better and your health isn't better. So you're just doing a a quick band-aid fix Mm -hmm. as opposed to really getting to the root of the problem or really addressing what it is. So I think um, that's one way that we set unrealistic I don't know if I would call them unrealistic goals. I would call that more unrealistic solutions because it's not a real solution. You know, you don't solve your problem. You make yourself feel better about having one. And so um, I think that would be one way that we set unrealistic things for ourselves. Other than that, I would be I would be willing to say that unrealistic goals are only unrealistic if you say they are. And again, I know my football example was a little bit outlandish, but, um, you know, if I set a goal and say, I want to be like Mel Robbins, I want to be sought out. I want to speak. I want to have a book. I want people to come to me and really respect my opinions and and what it is that I say. Why can't I? I? I can't be Mel Robbins. I have to be Tara Grebe. But why can't I? That's not unrealistic, you know. And the other piece of it is. Um, I think we put too much focus on the goal and we don't take enough enjoyment from the journey. You know, and you said something about 
celebrating wins or not celebrating wins along the way. And I think uh, it's actually Gary Vaynerchuk says this all the time. If you are so focused on the goal and you're not enjoying the process, sometimes you're you're missing the best part of it and you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You have to enjoy what you're learning along the way um, and and take joy from the little parts of the journey. And so if you can do that, then the goals that you set for yourselves aren't unattainable. It's just that you're setting goals that are too far out. So I think you can have an umbrella, you know, a big picture, but I think your goals, your actual goals need to be smaller steps along the way. Then you're having those successes. It keeps you motivated to keep going, so on and so forth. Um, You know, so I would say that's the bigger problem is that we, our goal is the end and not smaller goals along the way. I I love that idea of the umbrella as well. And I totally agree with you. And I think uh, even though we have amazing quotes uh, that become cliche, like success is a journey, not a destination. Those exist because they are absolutely true. And what I've learned in life is that who we become along the way is really what this is all about. It's not about checking off accomplishments or having this much money or this many books published or this many businesses, whatever it is. It's about all the learning, the connections, the relationships, Mm -hmm. uh, all of those experiences wrapped into one. one Listen, I'm going to be a little bit selfish right now and say this. I started the podcast because I had this idea of something that I wanted to put out for the world, but it also fulfills that, I don't want to call it performing, right? We're not performing right now. We're just having conversation, but it's still something that you put out that that the world can see and hear. Um, and that was my original thought was, I really want to do a podcast. I would enjoy hosting a show. It fills my bucket in that performance space. What I didn't realize was all I would learn from every single person that I talked to or the the overarching messages that I needed to hear. You know, one of the questions I ask every person is, what would you say to your old self back when you were completely dissatisfied or feeling like you needed more? And almost everybody says something in the wheelhouse of, I don't know what I was so afraid of, or I wish I would have started sooner, or I wish I would have done this sooner. Um, and to hear that myself, you know, as I'm building my bridge and having my self doubts and shooting on myself along the way, which again, we will continue to do, um, who knew that while I was trying to fill this bucket for myself in one area, I would inevitably fill other buckets for me, uh, for myself, just in the people that I've met in the process. Yeah. That's the real gift and the real lesson in this. I love that. You uh, you dropped some uh, really powerful names along the way, Brene Brown, Mel Robbins, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to, if what are your top three, if you can think of three, top three books or speakers or teachers that you would recommend for somebody who was looking to relieve some of the shooting pressure? Um, well, I Brene Brown is my favorite. Um, in the sense of her admission uh, and promotion that vulnerability is the way to go. And I think it's that one because it's hard because, you you know, you want me to pick three. And I would say if I could, if Mel Brown and Brene or Mel Robbins and Brene Brown could have a baby, (laughs) that's that person because I, uh, Mel Brown, uh, I do that all the time. Mel Brown, that's who it's going to be. You're already marrying them. I'm marrying them. <laughs> Mel Brown. <laughs> no, it's it's a combination of, be careful, don't ask me what I think I'm going to tell you, which to me is Mel Robbins. Yeah. And be vulnerable and, it, and, you know, be yourself, which is Renee Brown. That hybrid, if I could mush them to one person, I would say for that reason, especially as a woman, um, that is... a a hybrid of people that I really identify with. Um, I would say the next uh, example that I would give is a book, you know, you mentioned Glennon Doyle. I just bought that book two weeks ago. I could not put it down. And we have talked before where I buy a book because it's like, ooh, something new and shiny. And I get three chapters in and then I'm distracted by the next new book that 
you know, or when the work gets hard, you put it down. Um, I don't think a book as opposed to videos, podcasts, TED Talks, a book on paper has not talked to me like that book ever in my life. Um, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Okay. I, you know, she's talking about her struggles, but the underlying message, though her pathway is different, um, her underlying message is she was living the life that she should. You know, she was married, had children, and, uh, you know, there was a lack of fidelity in her marriage and trying to work through that. And underneath it all, she was a lesbian, you know, and and giving herself permission to say, this is who I am, and I'm going to go this way. I'm going to change direction, um, you know, but through that overarching umbrella, there are so many relatable comments that she makes about giving yourself permission to be who you are, regardless of what that is for you. You know, um, it, it, that book has spoken to me more than any other. And then my third person would be definitely Gary Vaynerchuk, which is interesting because um, some find him vulgar, some find him way too energetic. <laughs> they don't know what to do with all of his, you know, in your face. Yeah. I'm going to tell you how it is. But I really appreciate um, what he puts out there because um, one of my favorite things that he says, and I just heard this one recently, was he was talking to a person who was, I don't know, 20 or 22 years old saying, my parents want me to be a doctor, but I really want to be an artist. And they are going to be disappointed with me. They're going to disown me. They're going to whatever. And he says, so stop, you know, if you're going to go live your dream and you're going to talk about how they're not supporting you, then go move out, support yourself and build it yourself. You know, that's bold. Yeah. Listen, I just said to you earlier in this podcast that I, I was compliant and was a good girl and said, OK, I'll do what you think is right. You know, so um, he he, I think in short bites, tell it like it is is really, really inspirational and his messages are strong. I totally agree. <clears throat> he has a lot to take in for sure. And I think there's a really good lesson here too, is you don't have to like everything about everyone in order mm-hmm. to see about you and what they deliver. And I struggle with that too, because Gary, I mean, he's just so high, but his uh, high energy, I don't know if he's high, high yeah. energy. I mean, maybe, <laughs> whatever works for you, I guess. <laughs> But his uh, his book Crush It changed my mm-hmm. life. Whenever I was first coming into business, I mean it's it's kind of antiquated now, but it really helped me um, move into my current business as well. And I love that. I think I caught a, a separate message from him that said, if you are if your parents are paying your cell phone bill or your car insurance, and you're complaining about them having some influence on your lives, that's on you. If you don't want to listen to them, then you need to sever the time, be responsible for yourself and create your own dream. I think that is a really powerful message too. I love that you brought up Glennon Doyle again and Untamed. I listened to the book as well. And I agree. It was very powerful. And what uh, she went through it in a different way uh, than many of us have to worry about, right? Hers was kind of public. You know, she was already an author and... (laughs) Um, mm-hmm. that, that had a whole new level to that whole situation. So I was fascinated by that story as well. And I agree with you 100% on Mel Robbins as well. That five second rule when she wrote that book, that helped me get out of bed in the morning. I was That's doing right. work in the morning. I right, was you were a night owl. Morning. Yeah, but yeah. I, still, I struggled to get out of bed. And yep. that weird five second rule. Helped Don't know you why it try. works, but it does. Yep. It does. I'm going to ask, we're going to wrap up here, Tara, but I want to ask you the same question that you asked all your guests. What advice would you give yourself back when you were shitting all over yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, stand up for yourself and do the thing. Mm. Short and sweet, powerful. Tara, thank you so much for being here. Uh, delivering so much value and great insight. I've loved seeing you again. I have missed you, so I'm glad we got to do it again, and I can't wait for the next time. Me too. Thank you so much, Bill. If you're interested in learning more about Tara Green, you can visit www.sidehustlelounge.com forward slash VIP. 
That's the free VIP room, and I'll have a whole section just with Tara, her links to her uh, workbook, so you can, or her workbook called The Breakthrough You, yeah. as well as you'll see some information on her small group of masterminds that she offers. You can also just go to taragree.com directly or to the VIP room at silasalange.com. Thank you so much.